Um, I wanted to get your perspective on intermarriage. I think um, the two biggest failings of um, the modern movements is intermarriage and lack of education. I think that um, unless you have educated Jews um, who marry within the faith, um, the modern movements are going to uh, going to die. And I think intermarriage is more than just somebody saying, I am a Jew, I think you need to marry somebody who's Jewish and practices Judaism, however you define practicing, but certainly at the very least they need to be Jewish. Um, because Judaism is a culture, it's a family. Um, the whole family comes around the Shabbat table, the whole family comes around the Pesach Seder, the whole family comes around the Rosh Hashanah table, the whole family lights Hanukkah candles. And it's very hard when you have a non-Jewish spouse, and then the whole question is, the spouse doesn't convert, what do you do for Christmas and Easter? and what you get are confused kids. Uh, there's some people who can negotiate it well, but it's, it's, I think it's rare. Um, there's a, the second best thing, the best thing if you do have intermarriage, at least to raise your kids Jewish, but it's still confusing to the kids when they go to the spouse's house for Christmas and Easter and communion and baptisms. Those things are, 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 are hard, and a lot of those, there's more intermarriage among those kids and kids who grew up in Jewish families. So I think intermarriage does the Judaism no service whatsoever, plus it really disrupts the families. Families are hard enough to stay together as they are, but if you have different religions as well, that makes um, the family much harder to stay together. And as I've said over these many hours, family is the most important thing to me. It's interesting. The way, the way you spoke just spoke about intermarriage, you, you put it in very Kaplanian terms. Mm-hmm about culture, family, because a lot of the way um, you describe things are very, I, I, I kind of divide your outlook into God part and family part, and when you, uh, your family parts are very, um, more like Kaplan-ish. Okay. That was interesting. Um, I wanted you to comment a little bit on the role of women in Judaism and feminist issues. I think one of the, the best things to have in the 21st century all the way from, um, not Mayor Shireen, the most right thing, but for, certainly from Chabad and, um, and mainstream orthodoxy, modern orthodoxy, and of course the modern movement, is the, uh, the role of the, the changing role of women in society, where women are, rec are recognized, and the orthodox movement is separate but equal, and modern movement is equal and equal, which is really wrong, because women are different creatures than men. But I think as long as you recognize there's a huge role to women have played Judaism and not just staying in the house, um, I think that's a, that's a very positive role. But there are some roles I think should be women. I think lighting the Shabbat candles is a woman's role. Um, the primary caregiver of children, the nurturing genetic makeup of women generally is, is greater than that of a man. Um, I think it's nice when a man does kiddish when there's a man and a woman around. There's certain roles that I think are nicely defined um, and to stay that way, but whether a woman reads Torah or a man reads Torah, whoever is prepared the Torah reading doesn't make any difference. Whether a woman leads the service or a man leads the service, that doesn't make any difference. Whoever is the most competent should do that. But it's nice to have certain defined roles as long as you recognize that uh, women and men are, um, um, you know, are, are different humans. They can make you equal, but they're certainly different human beings. Um. Oh, a comment about uh, rabbinic, a little bit about rabbinic authority. Um, specifically, how do you navigate um, the rabbinic authority in the Talmud, and where do you decide um, what to keep and what not to? How do you pick and choose? <clears throat> like kind of the, I'll, I'll, let me rephrase it real quick. Like um, the decision between rabbinic decree and individual autonomy. I think that I. Um Ideally, you, you keep the commandments as uh, written in the Torah and defined by the rabbis and codified by Maimonides and the Shulchan Aruch, and that's the ideal Jew. Um, but unless you're Orthodox, that's uh, impossible to do. So um, I try to keep the, 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 the general laws of Judaism um, and at the same time keeping Shalom by it. So my preference would be not to drive on Shabbat, but then I would miss out on Friday night Shabbat dinners. Um, and then uh, sometimes when I uh, 
since I do drive for, for, to buy dinners, I'll drive to anyone who services if I can't walk, or if somebody's sick in the hospital, that's the only time I can see them. Um, but I, I try to limit my driving very much, although ideally I would not drive at all. Kashrut, I prefer to eat only kosher restaurants or vegetarian restaurants, I prefer don't buy it. I'll eat other restaurants and just try my best to make sure the fish I have has not been cooked with meat. Oh yeah, I got it. Um, so you have to, you have to, you have to kind of bend. Uh -huh. But um, so it's it's uh, oh, it, it's it's struggle, but I think you, you know, I, I try my best to serve Shabbat as best I can, to serve Kashrut as best I can, um, certainly serve the holidays as best I can. But if it's going to disrupt the whole family, then I'll. Um, I was wondering what uh, great Jewish leaders or great Jewish thinkers that have impacted you? I think um, Jewish thinkers is really the body of the Talmud in Maimonides and what little I know about the Shulchan Aruch. I think those are the ones that <clears throat> Rashi as a commentator, there are commentaries on, commentators on the, on the Torah and then back to me, because my main emphasis is Torah study and Thomas study. Um, philosophers, I rely more on my son Jeff, because I've not really, besides Maimonides, I've not studied the philosophers. Um, I think the Rebbe, um, the Lubavitcher Rebbe, through learning through Rabbi Nu and Rabbi Lou, has affected me, um, even though the, what I've read from him has been very selective. And I think he's been uh, certainly a giant in this, in this century. And the, with the few response well, I've read from Mutter Feinstein has affected me. I think that is. I am um, generally not a big fan of the law committee for the conservative movement. I think that's mainly a rationalization of how to live in modern America. So that's not something that's influenced me at all. Okay. Um, moving on to uh, your career. Um, how did you How did you choose to become a doctor? I used to, much as I took um, Jeff Allen Todd, rarely Michael, but uh, Jeff Allen Todd on rounds to the hospitals. Um, my father took me, myself, and Greg, and sometimes Kenny on rounds to the hospital. So I um, got a first interest in medicine from going on rounds with my father on the weekends to hospitals, and then. Um, when I was in college, I um, ran the school newspaper, the Daily Princetonian, and thought I wanted to be a businessman, but realized I wanted to be a successful businessman. You had to be hard to do that with then keeping all your morals with you without screwing people, and I decided I didn't like um, you know, getting the edge on people because I realized I was smart, and I could outthink a lot of people, and I probably wouldn't end up doing that business, and I didn't like that. And so then I went back to, I wanted to be a doctor. So um, that's how I decided that I wanted to be a doctor. Was there any one person that you really went to when you were making your career decision? Maybe my father. I don't know. Probably my father. And how did you choose rheumatology? Um, I had two interests. One was rheumatology, one was hematology, oncology. And I couldn't make the decision. Actually, where's that? Couldn't decide between medicine and surgery, and then I eventually decided on, on, on medicine. <clears throat> and then when I decided on medicine, I couldn't decide between hematology, oncology, and rheumatology, because they were the most intellectual of all the specialties. And I thought that it was much, I like much more using my intellect to solving a problem than using an endoscopy or a cardiac echo or liver biopsy, which is what I wanted to do more with my head. And, um, and then I became very friendly with a um, leukemia patient when I was a first or second year medical student. Probably, no, probably third or fourth year medical student. And he had repeated admissions and he died. I became very close to him like a family member and I cried when he died. And that's when I realized that if you become a hematologist oncologist, especially back then, less so now, that the patients become closest to are going to die. Because the ones who have five year admissions, they say goodbye and they'll come back to see you. But the ones you can like see they end up dying and that would be too hard to, for me to take. So that's how I decided to become a rheumatologist because it's the most intellectual of the uh, subspecialty, medicine subspecialties. And, um, and I realized back 
in the 1980s that if you figure out the right combination of medications for people, you could, you know, certainly make a huge difference in their lives. Um, and why did you decide not to be a surgeon like your father? Um, I had a very difficult time because I really loved cardiovascular surgery. Um, I did that as an elective my fourth year. And I loved cutting people's chest open. I was my first assistant on open heart surgery, and it was the most exciting thing in the world. But I realized two things. One is that um, that it was, I had no family life, and even though I didn't realize how important family would come to me, it was starting to become important to me then because the cardiac surgery really has no very little family life. And two, and the second is a story that I actually told one of your friends recently. It said I um, was invited over to Shabbat dinner with an Israeli plastic surgeon or surgeon, I don't remember what, whether a plastic surgeon or general surgeon. And I was, a, it was a, my fourth year medical student, and I said, I'm in a dilemma, maybe I was even an intern, and I was having a dilemma, no, the fourth year medical student, it was in New York, about um, whether I should go into medicine or go into surgery. And he goes, when I wake up in the morning and I have a choice of um, going to surgery or sleeping with my wife, he's a little more crude with sleeping with his wife, but when I have a choice, I'm more excited about going to, um, I have a surgery case, and I choose to go to run to surgery as opposed to sleep with my wife. You have to love surgery more than sleep with your wife. And um, I thought about that for a few days, and I realized that I didn't love surgery more than being with a woman. So that was one of my deciding factors. That plus a family issue of just why I decided to go into medicine as opposed to surgery. Um, that's very funny. Story. Um, do you have do you have any um, how how would you say being a doctor um, has defined you as a person? How has it changed you? Well, it's defined because I look at myself as a healer, and um, you know I, my I think one of my roles on earth. Can you for one second? I look at myself as a healer, and I think one of the reasons I'm here on earth is to heal people. <clears throat> Um, I've developed a subspecialty of patients with sick rheumatic diseases, <clears throat> rheumatic diseases, um, lupus and severe rheumatoid arthritis and Sjogren syndrome, vascular disease, unknown etiology. <clears throat> I pride myself in taking these complicated cases, in most cases, the vast majority, making people significantly better, if not almost normal. And, um, and there's nothing that gives me greater pleasure is when you see somebody who um, could hardly function at all or could hardly walk at all, and six months or a year later, um, their life's almost back to normal. So um, that's, that's one of the ways I define myself as a healer. <clears throat> How has the change in uh, technology over the, I guess you've been practicing over 20 years now, um, affected the way you practice medicine? Technology has not changed as much because that's been more for intensive care. <clears throat> the MRIs are better. The more MRIs, I guess MRI scans have helped, but it's mainly medications that have helped. The explosion of, of uh, the use of medications for um, uh, sick patients in rheumatology has really made the dramatic um, difference as opposed to technology. Um, there is a recent Time Magazine cover where it was about a year ago where there was a doctor sitting up in a patient bed freaking out and and it was all the whole article was about the way that doctors act as patients and I was wondering how have you now as a patient how has that affected the way you view being a doctor and and vice versa like the experience how has like been, being a patient changed the way you view medicine and the way you view being a doctor uh, I'm, a, I'm much more empathetic I've been sympathetic but I can understand um, patients hesitancy to take so many pills, and especially two, two times a day. I never, you say just get over it and take the pills, but I've experienced that. I've experienced fatigue where you're, one time I was so fatigued, I think it's of chemotherapy. I went to the bathroom at night and had to sit down on the floor. I had no energy to go from the bathroom, which is right next to my bed, to get up to go to my bed without sitting down first. And I've experienced this profound fatigue that patients, especially with severe lupus, severe arthritis, will experience. I never could understand that, but I've experienced that. Um, I've experienced 
Um, nurses messing, uh, messing up medications. I've caught many nursing errors. The patient would describe it and I would kind of shrug it off so I can, I can empathize with all the things the patient told me all these years that I've only been able to intellectually relate to before. So I'm a much more um, empathetic doctor. I've also become a much more a psychiatrist over the past 10, 15 years, but I've really understood depression and anxiety much more since I had depression and anxiety last year. And um, so intellectually, I've become, I've become a very good psychiatrist, but not gonna, I can relate to people and talk to them about it and hold their hands and really um, make them understand that's really part of the disease and that they will get better with the proper medication. Do you think um, experience is necessary to understand other people? Well, it helps a lot. <clears throat> I think it's rare the person who can be as uh, empathetic with the patient unless they've experienced themselves. I don't recommend every doctor getting cancer. Um, I remember when in medical school, there are some medical schools, I know we never do it, where every medical student had to have um, a rectal exam and then G2 put down to know what, what it felt like. Luckily, we got, we got spared that. And maybe not so lucky we got the spirit, but I think um, <clears throat> I just thought about it. You know, maybe there's maybe there needs to with, with virtual reality now. Maybe medical school, in the next generation, um, <clears throat> that would be a great project to to, to, to have patients experience um, back pain or fatigue. Um, <clears throat> A migraine. I happen to have migraines, so I've always empathized with patients with migraines, and migraines become one of my subspecialties because I've had migraines all my life. But that would be a fabulous uh, new business to have virtual uh, reality. And of course, when you have the virtual thing, once the person experiences a migraine, you shut it off like that. It's not fair to prolong it. But we'll call it virtual suffering. Yeah. Virtual empathy. But it would, that, that would, I think, it'll make a lot, a lot better. Doctor. Um, and how, now that you've been uh, an extensive patient, um, how have you, how have your views on the insurance companies changed? <clears throat> I have a loathing for insurance companies. I've had it since the mid-90s and it's uh, each, and since I've become a patient, it's become even worse. And that's why my, as you know, my, one of my goals is, should I survive this cancer, which I'm counting on doing, I'm going to lobby very hard to become Surgeon General. So I think it's only through a doctor who's, I think I'd be uniquely qualified because I practice subspecialty medicine, I'm a subspecialty cancer, and I have a, um, a, a clear coalition of CPR um, defibrillator committee, which God willing in two years will really be a, a national model. So I think I have all the qualifications, or as many qualifications to become Surgeon General. and. Um, to the insurance companies, it's, it's, it's a, their, their number one goal is to make money on humans. And it's just totally unethical. Um, when they raise and they double, triple, quadruple the price of medicine that's been out for four years because it's going generic five, two or three years later, that's unethical. Um, when they bid, when they all of a sudden decide that the top 10% of all medications for ulcers that they do is is not indicated. So the top 10% of antibiotics and price, and price, all of a sudden is not indicated without any kind of medical study showing that there are other drugs that are equal or superior. That's unethical. When they um, okay a, an experimental drug for me in, in 2006, and also in 2006 is not medically indicated, for, meaning that it's too expensive, that's unethical. When um, Test to follow my cancer are all willingly approved in 2006. In 2007, I have to fight for each one. That's unethical. So um, they practice business in an unethical way. So I have nothing but loathing for insurance companies. That's going to be for you. Right. Um, I was wondering if you could comment um, for a minute on um, your experiences after your chemotherapy when you went into depression, what that was like and what you gained from it and what maybe what you lost from it. Actually, it was after my uh, radiation therapy. I had my cancer diagnosed in December with surgery in December of 05. I had four courses of chemotherapy from January to the beginning of May. And then I had um, daily radiation therapy in Boston for 33 treatments in June and July. 
I got back at the end of July from Boston, I was commuting Monday to Friday, which was, I was getting a little depressed up there. And then I became uh, quite depressed and quite anxious with panic attacks. I see an incredible psychologist, Dr. Valerie Haveth, every Tuesday at 5 o'clock for months. And um, take Ativan at night and Effexor. In the morning was I able to get through it, but it was um, um, something that really took my surprise. But as Valerie pointed out, I had no plan before I had the plan of surgery and the plan of chemo and the plan of radiation. And I was just waiting to get back to life and waiting for cancer comes back and I had no plan. But it was um, <clears throat> a very disturbing time. I didn't want to be with people. Um, I, I didn't like conversation. And I'm a pretty social person. And um, I, it was uh, not, not a good time at all. But it made me understand depression and anxiety much better, as I said before, I became much more sympathetic to my patients. Beginning while well, I had the depression and anxiety um, all the way through last time I saw patients on uh, July 6th of this year. Um, how are you feeling right now? Well, I'm back on Ativan and Effexor, and I've got a plan. I had a few panic attacks in the hospital a few weeks ago, but um, it, right now I feel more intellectual anxiety about how am I going to get my heart and a lot of remorse about uh, having to uh, give up my practice. Well, you seem to be doing much better than when I remember your depression. No, I'm much better because I've, I've got a plan and I'm putting myself on Ativan and, and Effexor immediately. Ativan in the hospital and Effexor the day I got home from the hospital because um, I knew that knew this is fighting for life now. That's, that's just too high in emotion and stakes for any normal human being to, to stand without medications. Okay, um, we're going to switch topics a little bit to uh, community involvement. Um, when was your first community leadership position? What was it? When was it? Can you go back? I mean, it might be real early. <clears throat> I was in the Epstein School Board. The Epstein School is a Jewish, Solomon Tracker Jewish Day School in Atlanta. I was the Epstein School Board probably late 80s, early 90s, and I remember making a suggestion about um, something that needed to be done. I think it was Jack Halpern who said, you made the suggestion you will chair the ad hoc committee. And I've used that many times in my life to, to get people to, to do things and then make a suggestion they become, they become the committee chair. Um, so I was involved with the Epstein <clears throat> School Board, N not that active. And then I got involved in Federation because that was back in the 90s, early 90s, where it's very easy to make money as a rheumatologist. I became a big giver and I co-chaired the um, doctor's division for three years in the early 90s. And um, that's when I started fundraising. And um, my third year as co-chair, besides the campaign chair, I closed more cards. I, I guess listen more kids than anybody else. And then came the uh, mid-90s where Funds weren't so um, available to give. My income dropped because of the insurance companies. My inability to, to manage the business the way I, that uh, some doctors were able to. And so I was uh, um, taken off the Federation board. <clears throat> At the same time, I was asked to, to be a... Hey, Anna. How many do you get? Five. Five ones? Yeah. Yeah. Was it senior citizens any day? Yeah. Senior citizens don't tip very much, do they? Well, be easy, it is. It's be easy. The senior citizens don't tip very much, do they? Five. Yeah. Two, three. Three. Four. That's it. Four tips. Okay. You had a good day? Mm-hmm. All right. That was good, senior citizens. Federation took me off the board because I wasn't able to, to give as much. Um, I was asked by I was asked to become an officer. I'd been on the board at AA, but I wasn't very active. I was asked to become an officer, and um, so I put all my time and effort into becoming an officer at the Hagen Synagogue. I was a vice president for um, four years, president elect for two years, and then um, 
president from 2002 to 2004. And that was a major community involvement. At the same time, I ran um, about eight, maybe nine, you know, eight or nine um, programs, each of which was very successful, starting with Itamar Marcus, the director of Palestinian Media Watch, um, August of 2001, right before 9 11. And we ran one to two programs every year, last one being this February. There were musical programs, there were always fundraisers um, for different organizations or for the synagogue. And I got a great deal of ple pleasure out of that. And those, those, tell, um, tell me about getting Bill Clinton and getting to meet him. As you're we, so I'm saying, we had fundraisers, and we raised money for um, different Israel organizations, for Israel Philharmonic, um, for Georgia Philharmonic, the synagogue. We had a surprise 50th birthday party um, for, for our wife Janet. Jeff flew in town for that and surprised her. And it was, um, and that was a fundraiser for, I think, the synagogue. And, um, but having those eight or nine programs um, really highlighted my um, being an officer and being president even afterwards because they were um, cultural events that otherwise would never have happened um, at the synagogue and, and for the community. Um, one of the best things about our talking is the annual Leo and Barry Eisenstadt Memorial Lecture Series. We've had Nobel laureates from including Elie Wiesel, um, Nathan Sharansky, um, political figures like Joe Lieberman, Mel Albright. But the highlight was we had Bill Clinton during the one out of lecture we had when I was the president. And I got to spend at least five minutes with alone with him and Stu Eisenstadt at one point, which was a very highlight. And he spoke about his vision of the world in front of 4,200 people at AA, the largest crowd I've ever had. And that was a, um, to see his brilliance and his command of the English language and his command of world politics was, uh, was really truly a remarkable thing to see. The most amazing was that he answered the questions as to as I asked in detail, um, in as much detail as his regular speech was. So you really understood how brilliant the man really is. Um, you have a true knack for fundraising. Um, and if nobody's able to say no to you is the joke. Um, we comment a little bit about your tenacity for fundraising and what makes you really the best fundraiser I've ever come across. It's uh, easy to be a fundraiser if you, if you take a no for an answer you realize it's not personal. And it's um, a question of believing in your cause. If you believe in your cause and you're enthusiastic <clears throat> and you have to have a mental note when the best time to call people. Some people Best time to call at nine is nine in the morning. Some people between four thirty and five. Other people at nine o'clock. So I knew we always would know the best time to call people, um, <clears throat> to ask them. Some people on a Sunday afternoon. Some people on the cell phone. Some people never on the cell phone. So if you knew the best time to reach people and you have a relationship with people, and you really believe in your cause, now of course you have to donate also, not the highest level, but certainly at a high level, and um, <clears throat> it's pretty easy to fundraise, but. The most important thing about fundraising is you've got to be able to be very well organized and realize that, that no is not your problem. It's nothing personal. It's just something that pays for the person rarely doesn't have the money for, but usually just doesn't understand the importance of the cause. Um, do you have any like great um, fundraising achievements or any like one person who you didn't expect them to give a certain, like a real large amount or any like, I don't know, highlights of your fundraising career? Talking about the highlights of your fundraising career, mm -hmm. and um, if you could remember anyone that you like really didn't expect to get to give, and how you got them to do it, or some of the things that you would do that would that were highlights um, of your fundraising career. Um, I can't really give you any, an example. It's usually um, you form relationships and then you get somebody to start giving at a $500 level or a $1,000 level and you get them up to $2,500 and $5,000 um, but um, in the $10,000. But it's, um, I think just, <clears throat> well there was one, we were raising money for the Goodman Institute and we had to quickly raise um, Uh, at least three people could $15,000 and we were at a fundraiser at my mother's house. And um, so I got 
one couple on the way out, and then I told another couple that, you know, this person did it, then I told another couple, you know, he's a really good friend of mine, I really need to hit him to do it. So we raised fifteen thousand dollars, you know, within a twenty four hour period. But if you can get you always have to get that lead gift, the lead person to do it. And um, then another time I had a um, the last fundraiser we had, we wanted to get ten thousand dollar lead gift, and the uh, person said, I'll give you five thousand, but if you find another ten thousand dollar gift I'll as a challenge, I'll give you ten thousand. And so I got a ten thousand dollar gift. Called them back and I said, I have good news and I have uh, bad news. I said, the good news is we have a $10,000 gift. The bad news is that you're going to make this bad news into good news. And there's actually two good news. And he says, yes, the bad news is good news. And so he immediately wrote a check for $10,000. So, um, but if you, if, if you do it with sincerity and you, um, and you never, again, if you don't mind, if you realize that people are saying no, it's not a no to you, it's a no, no to the cause. If they don't have enough information about the cause, uh, then um, you know, then it's it's very successful. And when you do it for a cause you believe in, um, and especially when you set goals for yourself, when you break the goals, that's really exciting. What's the most you raised, and for what cause? I raised um, one of the first fundraisers. I raised uh, we netted ninety five thousand dollars, and our last fundraiser we netted ninety two thousand dollars. Four. But both of the Sunday guys. Oh, yeah. For A's on your And, um, and, we, and the goal for each one, the first one I'm not sure what the goal was. Second, second one, our goal was um, like 60,000, so we just shattered what we thought we were going to make. And this is, this is net. So it's always good when you um, raise for something you believe in. And, when you, and, when, and then the most important thing is you get a lot of people to give. I'm not sure they have 120, 140 people give. Ninety thousand dollars, and a net, then give them forty people give, because then you increase your fundraising base. There's a lot more calls, but you get more people involved, and so then then you keep the list, and the next time you'll get them to give again. You you mentioned that people say no, but I think that's a myth. Nobody says no to you. But people do say no. I've actually had a few people, and that's the only time I get angry. Not, but I don't show it. But you know, they'll they'll say yes, and then when they get the bill. They say they've never committed, and that's never. I'm talking about three times, and that's just never happened. I go back on records. I've never, ever, in my life, to my knowledge, ever put somebody down when they didn't, when they said no. But then people will sometimes go, and they don't understand what it was for, whatever. That's the only time I get upset. But um, no, people sometimes say no. They can't do it. That they're, they just sold their their practice, or they just gotten divorced, or they don't really believe in this cause. The person they're honoring, um, they don't like. And you know, and, and, or you know, um, they'll say, you know, I just gave you something in the past year, and I'll say, and, but I always have a record. I say, no, it was actually two years ago. Mm -hmm. And they'll say, um, well, somebody else called for something else, and I'll say, no, I'm the only one who calls. And then I usually get them. And sometimes they'll just say, you know, I really can't give right now, but most of them they can't give, and the big givers say, please be sure to call me for the next one. And of course I do. Yeah. Do, um, have you ever hit up the real high rollers? The, you know, I know you hit up the, the medium, but if you hit up like Bill, Bernie Marcus or any of the big... I tried ones. once on a fundraiser for, for Israel Philharmonic, but uh, we weren't prepared enough for Bernie Marcus. So I never got the, the, that, you know, that thing, big a gift. Most of my gifts are, um, my, most of my biggest are $10,000. And I may get somebody to give $30,000 for a project. I've done that before. Uh, $32,000, $35,000, whatever. But, but as far as fundraisers, it's usually... Um, ten thousand dollars a shot, but then I get people to give. We have a high program at AA um, to give ten thousand a year, so that's a sustaining gift. And you know, over ten years, a hundred thousand dollars. But usually, about some more more ten thousand dollar gifts, just because I'm not. If I gave a lot more money, which I wish I could, then I could get more. But when you don't give as much. It's, it's hard to, to ask for more than ten thousand dollars unless it's a you know one time deal something over, over many years. Uh, what is your earliest childhood memory? I think when I was getting um, gas anesthesia when I was four years old for a tonsillectomy and my father was right there with me and I was scared and saw my hands maybe okay. I think that's my very first memory. 
What was what was it like growing up with uh, your four siblings, and Grand Barb and Grand Bill, and being the oldest? Well, most of my time was spent um, practicing piano and studying. Um, and we'd play um, football in our backyard. That's what we're saying. You're telling me about uh, childhood and piano and your siblings. Oh. So we play football, I don't remember Saturday to Sundays with um, in our backyard often in the fall and winter and spring with Grand Bill and uh, Uncle Greg and Uncle Kenny. Rarely uh, Hank Karen would join us. I don't remember Rona joining us. And um, and then in the, in the in the summertime from June, July and August, we really had a, a, the, the pool was our main hangout. During the week, we weren't in camp, but especially on weekends, um, Grand Bar would never go in, but she would always make sure there's enough food there and never enough towels. But Grand Bar loved the pool, and that's where we uh, spent a lot of time. And even when um, um, you, Alan, Todd, and Michael were young, we would spend Sundays at the pool. So that was a, a major uh, um, hangout. And then we'd always have Friday night dinners. That was that was Grand Bill's connection to Judaism. Uh, through us, and um, we, but we always had Friday dinner at home. Um, once in a while, I guess, but mainly just six of us, um, with without um, my grandparents, and um, and that's where everybody would bring their uh, serious girl they were dating. Never Greg, Greg never had had one, but if you brought somebody to Friday night dinner, that's when that you were serious about. Who was the first girl you brought to Friday night dinner? I wonder if Jamie ever came once, but when uh, when your mom came, I'd been dating you to 10 days or 17 days or something like that. And that's when uh, Grandma Eva, a blessed memory, said, told her that she was going to if she was going to marry me. Grandma Eva already had it figured out. That's funny. Um, I had a, I had a so it was, it was everybody would, would bring the serious person, and I don't, I don't, I think it was almost without exception the first time. A serious person met somebody at our house was at our Shabbat dinner. Um, how do you feel about all the time that was devoted to a piano growing up? No, it was a wonderful discipline. It was a wonderful, got me, gave me a beautiful love for uh, for music and piano, and um, got me waking up early in the morning and practicing. Um, played many, 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 many recitals. Um, some solo piano, some dual piano with uh, my father and Greg would also be on the side of it. Um, it was a, it's a great experience. I wish I continued it more in adulthood. I always keep saying that when I have time, and I'm going to have plenty of time, <clears throat> closing my practice and I'll take it back up. But it's, uh, playing piano was a, was, was a wonderful discipline, a wonderful love for music, and thankfully we we'll passed that love of music on to, on to Jeff. And I think Todd really enjoys music too. Uh, Michael enjoys a different type of music, but um, the, the classical music, it just adds so much richness rich to your life. All right, um, you mentioned your grandfather. Um, I want you to touch on uh, Papa IT. Well, he was uh, the, the character of all characters. <clears throat> he, <clears throat> he was a Southern lawyer. He knew everybody, never forgot anybody's name. And um, he loved to make fun of people <clears throat> with made-up Yiddish words or with real Yiddish words. <clears throat> and he always had a quick, very quick wit. Whenever he'd walk into the, to a, a room of 30, 40, 50 people, within an hour, I mean, everybody knew him and he knew everybody. <clears throat> so he was the uh, consummate um, people person. And so I learned a lot from him about how to, how to deal with people. <coughs> Two stories from uh, Popeye T. Three stories. One is we were in New York for a second time. He'd been there a few years before, and we were in a hotel, and he recognized the, the, the elevator operator from several years ago. Said, "I think you're married," and it was correct. Another time is uh, he loved to make fun of waitresses, and nitsy is a is a Yiddish word for being not very smart. So we would have a a waitress <clears throat> at a restaurant. He was not very nice to waitresses. He would say, "Where are you from?" And he goes, well, let me guess, I think you're from Nitsyville. 
<clears throat> and she said, where's that? He said, well, that's right near Milledgeville or near Macon, whatever. Because, and we, of course, the kids, we were just all, you know, roar laughing. But he was, um, loved to make fun of people and using Yidd Yiddish words and made up Yiddish words. And then on um, three, he visited me at least two times at Princeton. <clears throat> and people loved him so much, he became an honorary member of our eating club, of Charter. <laughs> and nobody ever, he had a Charter t-shirt, but nobody's ever come an honorary member except for uh, my grandfather. So he was quite a character, and I made an impression wherever, wherever he was. It was just too bad that by the time he, um, he got older <clears throat> and his diabetes got worse, he, he became uh, kind of cranky, not kind of, but cranky. So Janet never got to know him as the Papa T that, that uh, I was told stories about. <clears throat> but in his heyday, he was, uh, you know, the ultimate personality. How about him in technology? Oh, whenever there was a first person to get to probably first, um, probably Jewish person to get a Rolls Royce, first person to get a car phone, first person to get a, uh, a calculator, I mean, huge, humongous things. <clears throat> but whenever something came out that was different, he was always the first person to get it, no matter what the price, because he wanted to, um, to have it. And he, he learned how to use it too. So he, so in today's technology, he would have just been, he would have gone crazy. How about um, scandals? Um, there's a scandal in his life in Savannah, but that's uh, something that's in a book. Do you remember the name of the book? You can go to hell. Um, go to hell something. I don't remember. Oh, you can go to hell, Scarlet O'Hare. <clears throat> By the name of it. So somebody can read that book if you're interested. Um, how about Papa IT as a lawyer? Well, he had a, <clears throat> a picture that he was very proud of for never losing a case in a year. One year he never lost a case and got an award for it and a picture of him with it. But he prided himself on hardly ever losing a case, which he <clears throat> rarely did. He was a, he could, um, very, very bright, very quick on his feet. Um, and um, he, was, he was an excellent lawyer. He started off being a lawyer for ASCAP, which is the Association for um, <clears throat> Composers, American, Association, American Society for Composers, Artists, and Publishers. <clears throat> and he would uh, go to small towns and make sure that he had a music box back then that you were paying royalties um, to ASCAP. And that's what he got, so that's where he started his career, became very prominent in that. And he was kept up a little tie with that when he became a lawyer. And, um, <clears throat> but he, but he always um, um, he took off on some big cases. Um, would get people off who were um, criminals. And he'd find some kind of loophole. So he was. Um, I don't know if he was prosecuted. So he was a defendant's lawyer, and he uh, loved what he did. He usually bigger than life. Did he get along well with Granville? They always had their rift because he still looked at um, my mother as his daughter. Uh, more so than as uh, my father's wife. Um, how is the world different now than when you were a kid? Well, the computer age. <clears throat> I mean, it's just uh, amazing that uh, you know you can ask a question and you can Google it or go to Wikipedia and you can get um, anything you want to. Or as um, Jeff and Michael know how to do, to go to YouTube and see any kind of a speech you want. So uh, instant communication has totally changed the world. And the techniques, not necessarily in rheumatology, but the technology in uh, many of the fields of medicine is just um, amazing. The fact that I can consider <clears throat> a heart transplant or even a way station to some type of artificial heart. And that was, heart transplants were done in the 1970s, but any kind of artificial um, um, Intermediate to, to that was, was no, I don't know anybody's dreams back then. Um, <clears throat> the way you can keep people alive, the way you can, um, when I had to have antibiotics for 10 days, it was uh, frozen antibiotics that I put in, you know, that were in the refrigerator five days at a time, and had an IV here that I could do it at home. And back when I started medicine, it was, you know, only intravenous antibiotic, antibiotics that. Um, in the hospital, then I became uh, intravenous antibiotics, where a nurse would come twice a day to your house, and now it's something you take care of yourself. So 
the, the advance in medicine had been incredible. The advance in communication had been incredible. Um, the instant, instant information, I mean, if you, you know, it used to be we'd never know the, what's going on to the newspaper the next morning, the 11 o'clock news. And now when a bridge collapsed in Minnesota, the whole world knows about it within two hours. So it's, uh, I think technology and communication have really made a, made a huge difference. Where, where were you when uh, JFK got shot? <clears throat> I was in um, either third or fourth grade, and somebody came in and told us that he was uh, killed, and I cried, and everybody else cried. In, in what way are you like um, your mother, and in what way are you like your father? I'm like my father, and um, <clears throat> I'm never, I'm, I'm, I think I said before, he's the best listener I ever know, so I try to be a good listener. But I, I think the community is very, very important. Um, Passing on Judaism to my children is very, very important. And those are two things that were very important to him. Also, medicine was important to him as a plastic surgeon, and medicine is important to me as a rheumatologist. Um, and the importance of family, even though my family has got its problem, but the importance of family to him was paramount. And um, I think I've expressed that very well to my family, the importance of family. Hopefully, you have a better success rate than, than, than he did. So, I think in all those um, areas, I'm, uh, and I'm, I'm compassionate, I think about people, um, I'm concerned about people. Um, I make the extra phone call. I learned that from one summer working with my father. In between cases, he was calling the Senate guy or calling somebody about for Federation, or, you know, he was always on the phone. Now with um, email and with uh, cell phones, it's so much easier. I don't know how he, I don't know how he was able to maintain a full practice and be sending out president or federation president with just um, a phone call and emergency room. That's just, a phone call in the operating room. That's just amazing. But I think communication I learned from him. From mother, I learned. Um, hey, we got those other. See you in 24 hours. How are you? What? What was I saying? You're talking about uh, Grandpa. <clears throat> Grandpa. No, you were moving on to Grandpa. Yeah. From Grandpa, I think I've, I've, I've learned appreciation for beauty, um, which I still don't have the same appreciation did she does. Um, I, I learned how to be critical of things without. And I, I know I don't criticize them but the way she does. I learned the importance of being, having critical thinking, trying to be as critical of people as, as, as she is. Or if I do, I keep it to myself. <clears throat> um, perfection as she was, my father was too, but I think my father was more so in, in his work. I'm a perfectionist like her own life, but it doesn't overtake my life. And. Um, I think those are the, you know, what I've, um, an appreciation for friends. She has her copy of friends that she, that she appreciates that I wait for her. And I certainly have that myself of, uh, you know, my friends, I'll do anything for them. So I think those are the things I've learned from my mother. All right, tell me about, uh, we did pop idea. Tell me about Grandma Sylvia. Um, I don't have much to say about her. Uh, she died when I was a teenager. Oh, <clears throat> I didn't know that. And Grandma Eva? Grandma Eva was another person who was larger than life. <clears throat> um, Janet uh, really got to know her in her last few years and formed an incredible friendship. But she had this... Um, she was wise beyond her years. She was um, perspicacious. She had this wisdom about her that saw into the future. Like she recognized right away when Janet came over, you know, 10 or 7 days that she'd be my wife. And she always had these uh, quick, quick barbs and wits. Often, she and my, and she and my grandfather, I.T., how people would, would exchange them back and forth, back and forth at the Shabbat table, which is really good to hear. But she had a beautiful smile. Um, she actually loved my father. Um, I get that same love from my mother. Um, 
but she just loved, adored my father. And um, she uh, owned a liquor business, a liquor store in Macon in Albany, and until my father made her stop doing it, she would get up every Monday morning at 4 o'clock and go to either Macon or Albany, she'd be back to be here by Friday. And she was uh, way beyond her years. Women didn't own liquor stores back then, and she did. But she was a modern woman long before it was popular to be a modern woman. She'd walk two or three miles every day until she could no longer walk because of her colon cancer. And um, she loved to talk about anything. She could talk about anything. Had, was opinionated, but, um, and put, it, put it in a kind way. And um, she was, uh, you know, really, 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 uh, she would light up the room when she'd come in the room. And again, it was a really nice set of relationships. She influenced Janet a lot in the last few years when she was dying. Um, but one of the things that I really remember growing up is the um, family discussions about Brylin. And I wanted you to touch on the Brylin situation. <clears throat> My father got involved in this um, ill-fated um, oil deal in Namibia in Southwest Africa. And he uh, did it, he wanted to make money, but the most important thing is he thought that he was going to save Israel. Everybody knows Israel has no oil. And his goal was, his ultimate goal was to be able to produce enough oil so Israel would be oil dependent. No, I'm sorry, oil independent. We wouldn't have to depend on anybody. And um, he got geographic experts and, and um, mining experts and all these experts he had to show that there was oil in Namibia. But what he never realized was the politics of a third world country was way beyond his uh, um, area of expertise as a plastic surgeon. So he learned the business aspect as well as he could. He was self-taught, as huge effort self-taught in business. Um, and he was running Bryland from his uh, plastic surgery office. But this is after he was president of AA and president of Federation. And he got a lot of his friends to invest $10,000, $25,000 in Brown and lost all their money. Um, but the main thing that happened is when they finally got, at one point, <clears throat> I'm jumping one thing, but at one point it's like $25,000 a quarter to, to the Namibian government to keep the rights for Brown, and then he realized that he couldn't obtain that. At the same time, he got a Chinese driller. Um, to drill the exact spot they said there was definitely oil, and the Chinese were waiting out with the Namibian government for him to stop paying the 25000 in concession so they could deal directly with the Namibian government because obviously the Chinese government's pockets were deeper than my father's pockets. So um, he never understood the, the importance of bribery and um, uh, deals not meaning anything, whether they're handshake or written in the third world, so that's why he never got the thing. Now, I've not heard, I've not kept up. I'm sure there's oil in Namibia, but it's, uh, um, I, yeah, I, I don't, I'm, I don't, certainly it's not going to Israel if there is, if there is any oil, but there is oil to, to, be, to be had on Earth if there was gotten there. But that was his ill-fated uh, um, oil scheme that um, lost a lot of people a lot of money. How much do you think he lost in it? Oh, probably close to a million dollars. And how did the fate of Brylin affect your family? <clears throat> well, we had, if, we, if the Brylin had come through, I mean, we'd have all been, you know, millionaires. No, but the experience of really him putting in all that effort and having it fail. But it affected Uncle Greg a lot because <clears throat> that really destroyed his relationship with my father. But it didn't affect... Us much as we were very, we were, we were passive. We see the stock go up and go down and crash. So um, it didn't affect him. Most of the money that was brown were, were gifts from um, from Granville, so it was not much of our money that we put in. I think it's interesting that he had come forth with such an idealistic goal, but without having much practical way of implementing it. Well, he, what he misunderstood was that dealing with <clears throat> um, Africans or anybody in thorough countries, just he thought, because <clears throat> he was well traveled and he had plastic surgery friends all over Europe, and um, he thought that the, the way you deal with educated people <clears throat> in, in Europe is the same way you deal with people in South Africa. 
And it's just, it's just a total, totally different. One thing we've touched a little bit on, but I, I wanted to go a bit more detail on, which is um, the split as, as when you were synagogue president of um, Analia and Mario, and how that came about, and um, the way the synagogue reacted, and what, and your role in it, <clears throat> and your opinion. Rabbi Goodman retired in June of 2002, right when I became president. We had a fabulous farewell um, dinner for him and um, he had brought in the year before and I was um, the incoming president so I was instrumental in bringing them in too um, and they brought some Mario Carpo from Chile and then Argentina we thought they were a breath of fresh air we had a Malava Malka uh, singing in our house after Shabbat one Saturday night which there was just stupendous with them. We thought they're going to be the the new light for AA. Um, but what we didn't realize is that <clears throat> South American culture is totally different than Western culture. And uh, Rabbi Goodman had difficulty with them. And when I became president, we had difficulty with them. <clears throat> I mean, just just had to deal with their wants and needs and personalities. But they won over many people, including myself and Janet, <clears throat> as spiritual people. What were some of the dividing issues? Um, it just, um, <clears throat> they expect, both of them, if they're not team players, <clears throat> if, if Rabbi Goodman was the rabbi, and if he said you need to do something, they didn't want to do it, they would undermine it. <clears throat> Either consciously or subconsciously. And <clears throat> that's just that the, taking orders is just not the way they grew up. I don't know if that's, that's, that, that, your mom thinks it's cultural, I think it may be the way the conservative movement works in, in uh, South America. And <clears throat> when I became president, we'd set policies, and we'd expect them to be followed, and they wouldn't always follow them. They would do what they thought was best for themselves and for their, uh, for their closest supporters. So um, <clears throat> then we had another person, Noah Shapiro, who's a very nice guy, but wasn't as strong as they were. And we had a triumvirate that first year that just didn't really work out. <clears throat> and it was clear we needed to get a senior rabbi, which we've been kind of trying to get since Rabbi Goodman left. And they applied to become senior rabbi. Two of them together. Caused a major uproar. And I um, <clears throat> the advice of uh, Harry Silverman, who's a Southeast Executive Director of the South, the Southeast uh, United Synagogue, said, you know, convene a special committee. So I had a special committee of 40 people set up from all walks of life, including past president officers and somebody from their camp, not their camp, old, young. So I felt very proud of myself, very, 40 people that really represent the synagogue. We were able to consider their candidacy first and give them an up or down vote whether we were going to um, consider them. <clears throat> and uh, that was a set for like a 7 o'clock meeting. And at 2 o'clock that afternoon, they, they called me on a conference call or on um, a speakerphone saying they didn't want they didn't want the meeting to happen. <clears throat> and um, I was beside myself because I put all this time and effort because I thought they did deserve special consideration. Because half the Senate got one of them, half the Senate didn't want them. And I thought um, that this committee would make the right decision because I'd particularly gotten people on there who both their supporters and not their supporters. But uh, maybe they counted the votes and realized they were going to lose the votes, or they didn't want to be subjected to that. But that's that was the um, that was the beginning of the downfall. And then that Shabbat morning, that was a Tuesday or Wednesday, or maybe the next Shabbat morning. Um, and I was really fed up with them. I wanted them to leave. Um, Mario said that he wanted they were going to stay for a while, um, and they were going to you know, look to go elsewhere, but they wanted to stay in Atlanta for a while. And at that point, I should have been strong enough to say, <clears throat> um, you know, you have to leave Atlanta or whatever, and, but I wasn't strong enough. I said, you know, you guys are spiritual, you have something to show something to give. So I, I kind of encouraged them to stay. And what they did was they looked around San Diego, Texas, one of the place, got acceptances at least two of those places. But at the same time, unbeknownst to me, they were forming their own synagogue to, to break away. <clears throat> How could you have told them to leave Atlanta? 
Well, no, I, I mean, they're allowed to live in Atlanta. No, no, that they were talking about leaving the synagogue when they didn't get their get into the vote. Um, you know, like they had to live, and I wasn't sure if they could leave in January, if they could leave in May, or what they were going to do. But I should have been strong enough <clears throat> at that point to say, either let's go before this committee and do it the right way, or um, you've got to leave here. You, you can't, you know, you can't. <clears throat> there's no way you guys can stay. But I didn't realize they were under. They were forming this uh, congregation in the meantime under my, right, <clears throat> under uh, under my uh, under my eyes. Um, so I, 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 was, I should have been much stronger than, than what I was. And how many? And they, how many people did they take from the congregation? Overall, they probably taken about 150 to 200 families. But they took the families that were involved, and that that was the that's the killing thing. The families in their 30s, 40s, 50s, who had kids, <clears throat> and that's what really killed us because it was the cream of the crop they took. How would you have done things differently if you were to replay that situation? I would have told them that I was going to um, have the meeting anyway with the 40 people, that five hours notice is not enough for me. <clears throat> or when he told me that Saturday that he was going to want to stick around and see what they're going to do, and then, oh, I'm sorry, that Saturday also said that they're going to apply through the national registry to the National uh, United Synagogue uh, through the rabbinical assembly. And I, that's, what I should, that's what I should have said, no, you won't apply. I said, you're done. You know? But I left an opening there. That's what it was. I said, I just should have taken a stronger stance and say, you know, let us consider you or you're going to not be considered at all. And you're just going to be, um, and you're not going to stay. But I didn't, see, I didn't realize they were planning on forming a different synagogue. How are things now between you and them? Oh, we're as friendly as can be for what happened before. <clears throat> um, we've gone to service there several times. They came to visit me in the hospital. And, um, you know, I still think the future of AA, um, <clears throat> we need to really consider uh, merging back with our Or Hadash. And um, the leadership the, right now is not, it's not for that, but. I think that needs to be considered because they're very dynamic people. They're looking for a building. We have a building. We're looking for a dynamic rabbi or rabbis. So to me, it's just a natural um, talking sessions that need to happen. It may not work out, but at least two sides need to talk. What What would you say? Um, uh, you, you've mentioned being stronger, but are there any other central lessons that you learned from the, this incident? Yeah, that, no, just that you need to, sometimes you need to, as a leader, you need to um, <clears throat> put your foot down and, and take the consequences. Because if you know what's right for the synagogue or you know what's right for the organization, you can get all the advice you want, you take the advice, and you've made, made, your, made your decision. And um, you, look, you look at what the political leaders do, Kennedy and the Cuban Missile Crisis is, a, is an excellent example. He made the decision. I took all the advice and he made the decision. So it's, it's uh, you know, to, to embargo uh, Russian ships from going to, to Cuba. So it's, um, you, have to, you, you have to take advice and say this decision is mine. All right, Dad, um, what accomplishments are you most proud of? I think my family is what I'm most proud of. <clears throat> I think your mom is an incredible beautiful person inside and out. Um, I'd like to take credit for causing me she's in the Jewish world and she has um, uh, gotten her master's, master's in Jewish studies. <clears throat> administration of um, Epstein School of Title changes all the time but basically she's the director of Jewish studies for um, kindergarten through fifth grade and she's got a, now a, a program for um, welcoming families in and making families feel welcome, and um, should she continue in education, she'll be a principal somewhere. So she's remarkable and welcome in her career. And at the same time, she's been able to, uh, you know, be an incredible wife and mother, and run a household. So um, and, and have wonderful friends and um, every, so much like Grandma Eva. Grandma Eva used to say, "Everybody who knows me loves me. To know me is to love me." <laughs> and that's really what Janet is. It's very. 
Uh, very, she has very few people who don't love her. Uh, I think it's a lot, and as uh, <clears throat> you've pointed out before, it's her, her smile and her laughter that just warms up everybody. And then I'm very proud of my um, oldest son, Jeff, who he's accomplished in as many different careers so far at the age of 25. And how he's grown as a, as a true intellect. Um, <clears throat> hope he finds a wife who can um, meet his standards. But um, what he's accomplished in life at the age of 25 has just really been very impressive. I'm very proud of Alan for being the mayor of Kroger. What he's done with Brad Flex is amazing. And I think if Todd finds the right job, he can do the same thing in his job. And I'm very proud of Michael, who has um, severe attention deficit hyperactivity syndrome. I mean, sorry, disease. Disorder. Disorder. <laughs> ADHD. Um, and what he's been able to accomplish, I think, is stripped to Israel this summer was wonderful for him. He's an incredible person. And if we can just channel him the right way, then I think he will be a, a blessing to the world. So I'm most, most proud of my family. I'm also very, I've had a wonderful rheumatology practice. I've been able to help many, many, many people, um, often with severe illnesses. And I'm proud of the community work that I've done <clears throat> um, throughout the community, um, both at Havadalim Synagogue and Beth Phila, the FC School Federation. I didn't even mention it a few years ago, two years ago, we had Hadassah fundraiser and um, I was part of the effort that raised over $250,000 on the first Dasa Gala. I um, got the honoree myself, um, and because of him, they raised the, their family gave seventy-five to one hundred thousand dollars. So that's actually the biggest gift probably I've gotten. Um, and um, we made the Dasa Gala very successful, and that was a large part of that. So, just my influence on different organizations, and then finally that I've been able to influence a lot of people. And mainly from my um, my tour study class that I taught during tour reading um, from 9.30 to 10.30 um, for about for, for four years before I became vice president. Um, I taught that at AA every Saturday. And that was uh, influenced lots of people who have found their Jewish journey since then. So, And I've influenced other people since then. So I think my family and the way I've influenced people and as a physician and then how to influence organizations, those are my biggest accomplishments. What is the one thing you like to be known for? Like if, when people talk about you, they should say. I'd like to say that he was a kind, compassionate, <clears throat> listening person who cared about people and always tried to make people grow in a positive way. All right, and then um, who are who are? Well, you've talked about um, Granville as a hero. Do you have any other heroes? I mean, he he comes he's come up throughout this. I think as your probably your biggest hero, but it didn't have to be family, but someone else who you would consider like one of your life heroes. No, I told you one of my greatest regrets. I never had a mentor. I think that would have changed me a lot, but I've never really had a mentor. <clears throat> um, in my professional life. I've been influenced by many rabbis at different times, but um, <clears throat> but I guess my, my only real hero would be my, would be my, um, my father. 